Hello friends, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Every Thursday afternoon, 1 to 1.30 p.m. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we will be discussing the evolution of a sociopath and the myth of authority. This is from my blog post by the same name. If we start with a stateless society, where will the minority of sociopaths go to carry out their devious plots of fraud, theft, assault, and murder? Since there is no governing body, per se, whereof to infiltrate and assume control, they will necessarily have to do the evil deed themselves. They will inevitably discover that doing evil things results in a difficulty of making friends and engaging in trade with other people. Since people talk and word will get out of the presence of a sociopath, they will necessarily be ostracized by society as one useful nonviolent method of dealing as is one useful nonviolent method of dealing with sociopaths in a truly civilized society. If he determines that acting alone to be too dangerous and frightening, he may join with other sociopaths to form a gang or mafia. Acting as a group, they can subjugate small villages or communities and intimidate them into obedience by their threats of violence. They will then be able to live as a parasite off the productivity of the industrious in such societies. They may kill the strongest members in the group for the purposes of striking fear into the rest, but they would not eliminate the majority of the inhabitants for that would substantially decrease the number of producers that would provide for their subsistence. The violence associated with the rule of gangs and mafias is common knowledge and is therefore openly recognized. If, however, such a sociopath exists in society already ruled by the monopoly on violence known as government, there appears a plethora of available options for our sociopath to choose from which will significantly reduce his exposure to danger whilst committing his evil deeds. This is regardless of the fact that when he chooses to join the public sector he will be in the company of his fellow sociopathic kin who all know and understand that to join the ranks of government is to have access and use of the biggest and most powerful gun in the room. The state, through its use of the military and police, is the largest indisputable mafia of the land. Make no mistake about it. Although the old twisted sociopathic men rule government, they do not carry out the violent dirty work. It is faithfully carried out by previously decent men and women whose minds have been corrupted by the belief that what they are serving is something other than an institutionalized monopoly on violence and getting paid in currency that is anything other than something stolen from the industrious. If you are a government employee, I strongly urge you to re-examine your role in society and how you think your job is really benefiting society. A murderer at the reins of power is still just a murderer, regardless of the title he flaunts or the expensive garb he brandishes. Such superficialities do not change acts of morality. I end with a quote by Frederick Douglass. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those they oppress. Frederick Douglass. Okay. So, sociopaths. A, a word that 
Many people do not like to ascribe to our political masters, but um, is in fact one of the most, um, one of the best ways to describe them, right? Sociopaths typically um, lack compassion, um, lie without remorse, um, are able to kill indiscriminately, and after all that, are still able to go home, sleep in their beds soundly, kiss their wives, hug their children, and it's, it's really amazing the, the degree to which some of the people in government um, are able to carry out their wickedness, <laughs> the best way to describe it, um, without feeling such repercussions, such emotional, spiritual re repercussions. You have to have a certain level of insanity, all right, of sociopathy, to function this level, it's, it's, it's can be compared to a pathological liar or a serial killer or a serial rapist. However, um, that's really not an accurate comparison, right? Because um, let's say, for example, the serial killer, serial rapist, or even petty thief, um, these people are you know, have problems, they commit these crimes. However, the difference is they do it themselves, okay? So they risk imprisonment, they risk getting caught, they risk imprisonment, okay? Um, and also they, they tend to do it basically just to um, enrich themselves and their family, all right? So they do it at significant peril to their own welfare. All right, uh, and then and then you have um, the next level up, which would be the professional um, sociopath, which would be like the uh, the crime bosses, you know, the drug cartel bosses, the mafia bosses, right? Like uh, like the Godfather. And these people, at best, we can say Al Capone as well. These people, at best, have influence over perhaps um, maybe a couple of towns, right? They control and they regularly extort their victims. And uh, of course, they rely on good reputation as well. Um, but primarily, they, you know, um, they need people um, supporting them, carry out, carrying out their violence for them and extorting the, uh, the victims, people who live under them and uh, receive their protection. So... They are somewhat of a comparison, but however, the difference is they don't have um, public schools to indoctrinate the young into obedience. They don't have the mass, um, the mainstream media to further um, corroborate their actions and, and uh, support their, um, their evil. Um, and they don't have a military that can, you know... <laughs> invade foreign countries, you know, overthrow governments, um, prop up um, murderous regimes and uh, supply them with arms and, you know, things like that. So they don't have that capability, right? So, so then you get to the next level, which would be the near godlike um, sociopath, which would be the politicians. And these can be compared to the, the despots and tyrants of the past that we read about in the history books, all right? You know, you read about Attila the Han or Alexander the Great or Caesar or um, um, Napoleon or, you know, then you get more modern um, Hitler and Mussolini and Pol Pot, right? Uh, Mao Zedong. Um, but but actually talking about the monarchies, you know, the, the, the kings of England, kings of France, kings of Spain, um, they derived, and also actually ancient China, they derived their authority through divinity, right? So they claimed the, the right to rule 
through divine right, right? So all of a sudden, if you were to resist or disobey a mandate by a god king or also a sapa inca, um, then you are not only disobeying the state, but you are also committing blasphemy against God. All right, so this was sociopathy taken to a whole new level when uh, when the divine right of kings emerged. Right, so which is pretty ingenious because to a society that is deeply rooted in religion, um, the last thing that a population wants to do is to insult God, right, and blaspheme God because. Of course, um, there's always that eternal threat of, uh, of damnation, eternal damnation, right, in the afterlife, which, of course, nobody could uh, prove, right? <laughs> but it was always a threat. So, so people didn't want to risk it. So for the most part, uh, monarchies and the uh, divine right of kings subsisted for many centuries, probably even millennia, um, yeah, millennia, and um, and only recently um, we've become to dissociate ourselves from religion. And today we no longer have kings in the same way that we did. I mean, we have you know the king of England and the queen of England, but she no longer um, we no longer believe in this divine right to rule, right? Rather, today we believe in um, government and the state through representative democracy as being um, acceptable, right? Um, but if you really think about it, it's rooted in the same basic beliefs, okay? So it's basically a mortal man or woman uh, rising to power oftentimes in a situation of economic upheaval, right? Um, great, you know, after a revolution, regime changes, um, great instability, and all this, out of all this, you know, the people are clamoring for a ruler, right? And, uh, and unfortunately, this is a situation where some of the most brutal despots have risen to power such as Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, uh, Pol Pot, Mao Zedong, and has oftentimes resulted in the deaths of millions of people, millions of people. So, we have to realize that even the modern day um, oligarchy, known as um, government, right, which is ruled by few, or you can also call them in a sense the aristocracy, <laughs> they are in a sense the aristocracy, um, they are virtually no different from the monarchs and the god kings of the past. Okay? Um, we give them near unlimited power, near unlimited power, and, and the truth is that they could not wield that power so successfully if the people did not actually believe that they had this power, right? So their power does not necessarily come from, um, you know, it doesn't come from the top or not even from the law enforcers, right? Or the military, not, not even from them, right? Because they constitute the vast minority of people, right? So the majority, the people that are being ruled, the over 300 million people, let's say in the United States, over 300 million people being ruled by maybe a couple of thousand can only persist when there is a very deeply ingrained um, belief that they have the moral right to rule, okay? That they have the justification, perhaps through voting, um, perhaps through our government indoctrination, schooling, um, perhaps through the mass media, which um, which propagates this um, mental virus of statism. It's all these things together that contribute to the um, to this love affair that we have with 
rulers and masters. Okay, uh, Lysander Spooner said that um, a man is no more free if he can choose, or a man is no less a slave if he can choose a new political master every four to six years. All right? So, you know, imagine that on a slave plantation, <clears throat> right? Slaves believe themselves to be free because they can vote for a new plantation master. <laughs> and looking at it that way, it's easy to understand how illogical the whole situation is and how, how these people, they really don't care about the people at all. They, they, they just, they can't, okay? <laughs> it's really impossible for a few hundred or especially, you know, even a, you know, a few at the very top, you know, vice president, president in the cabinet, to, to do anything for the benefit of over 300 million people. It's very, it's, it's completely absurd. Um, you know, some people tell me, well, we have to live in a hierarchy, right? Because that's, look at the animal world. Animal worlds live in hierarchies, right? There's the alpha male, there's the subordinates, there's, right? there's different um, levels of, um, of authority, right? And that's just the natural way, you know? Why do you, you live in a condo association, right? So that's authority, right? You, you pay into a board and the board members make decisions on your behalf. All right, or you live in some kind of commune, right? And um, and and you you know maybe again you have board members, right? Or or let's say I've I've heard this comparison. Uh, you know, it's just like the orchestra. You know, the orchestra has a conductor, right? So what's wrong with that? How can an orchestra play without a conductor? Um, when in fact you have to take into account that the federal government is entirely separate and um, much different, worlds different than uh, a condo association board or an orchestra, okay, or a commune. For many reasons. Number one, <clears throat> um, these entities do not wage war, mass murder, drone strikes, nuclear, nuclear bombs and detonations on other condo associations, communes, or <laughs> orchestras. They don't print their own money with which they can rob the prosperity of the unborn through fiat currency creation, which is one of the most um, heinous crimes to, to do to our youngsters. I mean, to imagine that right when they're born, they have on their heads about $200,000 of debt, right? In order to continue our uh, comforts and our lifestyle, right? So, and, and not only ours, but especially the people, uh, you know, who are in control of the, uh, of the monetary system and the federal government. They're more the ones that reap the benefits. But um, that is the gift that we give to our children when they come into this world. <laughs> what kind of sick, twisted world is this? So, so, yeah, so they don't have the ability to wage war. They don't have the ability to, to create and counterfeit currency and force everyone to use it. Okay, they don't have the ability to make threats and commands backed by violence, known as laws. They don't have the ability to rob their uh, members, right? So there's a lot of things that are much different that cannot be compared. The federal government is unique, to say the least. <laughs> it's uh, you know some people have described politicians as parasites. I've done that too. But then again, that does an injustice to parasites, right? Because parasites, even parasites, only take what they can consume and then they fall off, right? 
government and politicians take much, much more than that. It's not like uh, we're going to get to a point where the government is going to say, you know what, we had enough. Thank you. We're not going to tax you anymore. <laughs> no. The limits of political parasites or government is the degree to which the middle class or the industrious is willing to support it through our innovation, through our creativity, through our hard work, through our obedience. That's, that's the only measure of the continuation of this generational theft, which is known as taxation and government. <clears throat> um, and, and, it, and it can really only happen when people give them legitimacy, right? When you, you know, you, uh, you go to vote and, then, and the people believe, they're given the delusion to believing that through voting, it legitimizes whatever the politicians decide to do after that. And we must keep in mind that um, many of the genocidal and murderous regimes of the past that we so vilify in our history classes have themselves had constitutions very similar to ours with sections for free speech, freedom to bear arms, freedom to assemble and protest, okay, freedom to vote, So, examples of such murderous regimes that have had these constitutions are Nazi Germany, Communist Red China, Soviet Russia, right? Many, many um, of the worst, horrendous governments in history have had constitutions. And what good has it done them? What good? Just like we have a constitution written over 200 years ago, how much folly is it to really believe that a constitution, a piece of paper written by men, can prevent the rise of dictators and tyrants? And, and to think that this country, which was the experiment at the time of limited government, of freedom, has devolved and degenerated into one of the, one of the most imperialistic, genocidal, nuclear superpowers the world has ever seen, is unfathomable. It's unimaginable how, how much we've missed the mark. You know, it's not like, it's not like, you know, you, you fired a gun at a target and you missed the mark by a little bit. No, you fired the gun and the gun exploded and you were thrown back by the explosion. <laughs> That's how much we missed the mark. <laughs> so we have to put into perspective what government actually is. And the um, the impotence of constitutions and the absurd expectation that they would restrain or limit anything, right? And the whole concept of limited government is that we are the government and we will limit it, right? Which is entirely absurd as well, because we are not the government. Um, the government is separate from us, okay? Because if we are the government, then we must have decided how much money to borrow from the Federal Reserve last month, right? We must have all decided to, you know, which country to wage war in the Middle East, right? And we must have uh, decided um, the ramifications of the Patriot Act, right? Or the NDAA, right? Or the Affordable Care Act. We must have decided that, right? Since we are the government. Or even further, if democide and mass murder by one's own government occurs, 
then according to that logic, those people committed suicide because they were the government. <laughs> so obviously, we are not the government. We are something entirely separate. Okay? We are not taxpayers. We are tax victims. Right? Taxation is theft primarily because it is immoral for one man to steal the property of another man if he hasn't earned it. Right? Um, but in our twisted society of giving sociopaths an institution where they can go to better realize the fruits of their tyrannical whims, <laughs> that is accepted. Right? That is entirely accepted. So you have a situation uh, with when you, when you create a government that actually attracts the worst scum of society, the people who only want to live off of the productivity of others, who, who don't want to create, don't want to work, don't want to contribute meaningfully in any respect, okay? So you have an institution of centralized power. And who do you think will be attracted to this institution to run it? Good people? Virtuous people? Decent people? Of course not. Why? Because these people are making real change in real ways. Okay? Rather than opting into an institution that only survives on the violation of property rights and self-ownership all right and is ensured by violence backed by the gun of violence right a law is an opinion backed by a gun an opinion of a sociopath and we have to rid ourselves of this myth of authority, this myth that some people have the authority given to them either by God or by the people, by voting, right? Regardless of where it's given, when we examine the underlying nature of it, we can understand the immorality of it. And this is where education comes in. This is where it's so, so important for people to understand why we, we advocate for self-ownership and property rights and non-aggression. Because there is ways for humans to live without violating the property of others. It is called capitalism. I know some people conflate capitalism with greed, with corruption, <clears throat> but all this demonstrates the genuine misunderstanding of uh, economics. Okay, capitalism is free, unfettered trade between people, between peaceful people. And when that is embarked on, it's a win win situation. Everybody benefits. Okay? Government is inherently a win-lose situation. It's a mugging. It's a rape. Okay? It's a win-lose. <laughs> One person benefits at the expense of another person. And this is not necessary to live, for us to live as a society. So I'm going to stop right there. Thank you very much for listening. This is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care.